this week on To the Contrary. First, a spike in transgender hate crimes. Then, are female CEOs targeted unfairly? Behind the headlines, bringing more African American women into STEM fields. Bonnier Bay, welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, transgender women. Penny Proud is the latest of at least five transgender women of color who've been the target of alleged hate crimes so far this year. That's compared with 12 for all of last year. Outraged activists are staging die-in protests and communicating on social media with the hashtag Black Trans Lives Matter in response to the trend. They say their plight is being ignored or even undermined by both the media and the mainstream black community. They charge the media frequently use the wrong terminology, disrespecting trans people. And even the mainstream black community often fails to include them when fighting for social justice. So, Danielle Moody Mills, why are we seeing such a rise in this uh, kind of crime? I think because we're starting to understand as a society that transgender people are actual people and we're recognizing when horrible, violent things happen to them and standing up for them. I think transgender people gladly have stopped living in the shadows of this country and so they're out in society a lot more and unfortunately with that comes the scrutiny and these sad effects of people mischaracterizing them and then wrongly abusing them as well. Now I really don't know why we've seen this huge spike at the beginning of the year but I'm hoping that that's all it is, a spike, a temporary moment and not the beginning of a long-term trend. Well, it's interesting to see whether people are just uh, reporting these incidences more or if it's just that um, there actually is a spike. So to the question of data collection, whether or not this is something that's really new or people just feel encouraged to be able to share their stories. Well, one of the activist claims that we mentioned was that the, the black mainstream community doesn't care about, is not paying enough attention to transgender women. Um, is that true? I don't think that that's true. And I've actually written... Um, on the Black Lives Matter movement many, many times. And what we know is that the Black Lives Matter movement is being led by queer LGBT people of color, specifically black lesbians that are talking and have started the hashtag, the Tumblr, and the social media force around this. And so what's important to understand is that all black lives matter, and that's the conversation that we need to be having and not trying to pin one group against the other. So I think that right now it's a conversation about three women, five women were killed in one one month. That's outrageous, and we should be having a national conversation about that, and I think that that's what they're trying to do. Well, and in, in addition to the problem with transgender women um, being killed, there's also a lot of black, the whole police murder, um, Black Lives Matter issue. Uh, 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 there have been 15 black women killed uh, in the past year or so, and yet all the attention is going to the men, the Eric Garners and the Michael Browns. Yeah. Why is that? Well, I think, you know, the black community is a microcosm of the American community. We live in a patriarchal society. And so necessarily that means that issues that affect men tend to percolate to the top. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we're not, we're not, you know, immune from that same sort of issue. It's but I mean, is there a movement within the mainstream uh, people of color community to try to get the women out there and make, you know, black lives matter, black women's lives matter, black, black transgender lives matter, or, it, or is that not the kind of activism that's going on? Uh, I think it needs to be the kind of activism that's happening. I mean, in general, I think we're seeing uh, a missing value of the, of the value of lives, you know, where there's a, a misunderstanding and, and a mistrust or you know, people are just not <laughs> respecting one another, and, and all lives, and, and all violence against anyone is, should not be something that's happening. And whenever it happens, it should be called out, regardless of who is the, uh, the subject of that kind of violence. Uh, yeah. So, what, and, but you were saying, living in a patriarchal society, how, how much is the media at fault? Well, I think the media is very much at fault. I mean, there is a, a, a narrative that black equals male, uh, woman equals white. And so it's very hard when you don't fit in those 
easily checked boxes. Tell, tell me about that attention. narrative, though. Uh, I, I think it's Explain sort of, that. I think it's a normalized narrative that we've actually been dealing with in this country forever, <laughs> pretty much in terms of how we sort of contextualize challenges in this country. When we think of gender and issues that related to gender, the typical frame that we have in our minds tends to be that of a white woman's perspective. And we oftentimes, we, we don't really dig down into the specific challenges that women of color face. Likewise, when we think of issues of race, we oftentimes specifically think of men, particularly black men, and the particular challenges that they face. It's very hard for the intersexual, inter, intersexual, intersectional story to be told. And unfortunately, we have to do better a better job of making sure that those issues are addressed. And to, to piggyback off that, the idea that we have to break down the stereotypes around black men and about black men being dangerous, right? Black women don't necessarily have that same connotation along with them, that they are dangerous and that if you see them, you need to fear for your life. And this is shoot first and ask questions later mentality. So while there have been 15 women, and I'm sure the numbers are much higher than that, the idea has been when you see black men, you people feel danger. And these police officers that are armed, for some reason, feel that their lives are in danger and can take that person out. And so that's a broader conversation about stereotype and how we gender people and how we racialize situations because of what our kind of normalized thinking around what is good and what is bad. Mm -hmm. No doubt. I, I think this is just terribly sad as somebody who's not part of the black community, just watching it from the outside is gripping because this could happen in any community, but the black community suffers from this mischaracterization because these police officers, and I'm not going to say what race, but when you're walking around a community that when all you're doing is arresting, say, 50 black guys, mm -hmm you're going to think that every black man is dangerous. And so when they see the women, they're not sure how to react. I think the only way we can fix this is community relationships. Mm -hmm. The law enforcement have to build relationships with women and men in the community who are not dangerous. And that can facilitate greater understanding and education and dealing with these tough, tense situations where their first thought may be to fire. All mm -hmm. right. Let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie Urbay. From social justice to corporate fairness. A first for the big four accounting and consulting firms. Deloitte just named Kathy Engelbert as its first female CEO. But she may be looking over her shoulder for activist investors, those shareholders who pressure companies to change. At least a quarter of the women CEOs of S&P 500 companies have been challenged by activist investors. That's at a higher rate than male CEOs getting challenged. Yahoo's Marissa Meyer is just the latest CEO to face scrutiny from activist shareholders. Some critics allege activist investors have a woman problem, but the investors say their motives are purely financial, having nothing to do with gender. There is another explanation, the glass cliff theory. Women are more likely to be appointed as CEOs of companies that are struggling. This means they're more likely to face action from activist investors because the company was not doing well to begin with. So Patrice, uh, is it a gender issue here? Is there gender bias and discrimination? Or is it just that women are taking over companies like Marissa Meyer and Yahoo that are failing? And that's the only kind of company that will take a risk on a woman CEO. So it's possible both are, are occurring here. I mean, at the end of the day, these investors are looking for the towards the bottom line. And it's, research uh, shows that women-owned uh, companies, their stock prices outperform those of men-owned companies. So that's interesting. So if you're looking to the bottom line, you don't want to cut your wallet um, by inducing your own uh, gender biases. Uh, but at the same time, if women are getting into some of the struggling companies, uh, we're going to cheer on the gladiators. I mean, to all those women who are able to turn around a company, that says that someone believes that we are capable and able uh, to, to draw on the, the unique abilities that we have to really get something done. But that's an unfortunate reality. Uh, it's an re unfortunate reality that women face. It's an unfortunate reality that people of color face. That oftentimes when you're appointed to these positions, you're in a situation where the company is already at peril. I mean, look, frankly, look at the president of the United States. Look at what happened with, with the previous president. I mean, <laughs> would we even have a black president if we didn't have a president that right before him took this, this country to the brink? And so it's a, it's a constant thing that we see. And you're putting people in unfair situations where they have to sort of make a miracle happen in order to be able to stay in their positions, and it's just not right. I think that women are being set up to fail to some to some extent at these 
at these corporations that they're but being asked. But Meyer to, has really, she's look been, at Yahoo, and she's, she's really turned she's it turning around. It, she's turning it around, but she's also walking on a tightrope, right? Like, she's turning it around, and she's buying and investing in company, tech companies overseas, in these startup companies that are bringing in billions of dollars into Yahoo, but she's still walking a tightrope. And I wonder if a man had taken over Yahoo, if they would been, have been giving the leeway and the breathing room in order to see a turnaround. I feel like when women are put in place, and especially women of color, are put in place in a leadership role, that there is this ma magic moment that's supposed to happen. And it's the same thing that we saw with the president, like Avis had said, that, oh, by magic, all of a sudden the country is supposed to turn around after eight years of going over a cliff. And so I think that we have to have realistic expectations. And these investors, if they really do care about the bottom line, then they need to create a strategic timeline so that these women can be successful. I what about Indra, Indra New Yuri at, um, at PepsiCo? Well, Indra Nui at PepsiCo came in under some different circumstances than Marissa Meyer over at Yahoo did. Marissa came under this banner of how is she going to manage work life, children, the office, being the head of this m massive thing. Indra is older. She's sort of, people look at her as wiser. They, she's also an immigrant woman as well, a woman who comes from, a lot of Indian Americans are perceived to be in these highly intellectual roles. So she's earned her way there instead of just stepping into something because there was somebody who wasn't capable of the job. But I think overall, yes, we've set up. Did she face activism? Activist I don't think she's faced investors. it nearly as bad as, as any other woman CEO. I think she's had a good good part of that because she hasn't faced it. She And I think it's because she's also older, too. And I think that is, that's helped. People are sort of like, well, she's wiser and she's had some real successes. But let's not forget that she's just an anomaly here. But, you know, when you're talking about companies like Pepsi and Coke, yeah. Coca-Cola, um, did she also help? by the fact that so much of the market, I mean, I, I'm a, I imagine that they're selling more uh, bottles of Pepsi in, in India than they, <laughs> right, yes. than they are in the U.S. Well, um, I, I think that there's certainly an element to that. There's the there's global sphere that we're looking at it in, whereas our American CEOs, we're sort of holding them in more because of this, the societal shift we're having right now and seeing women wanting to be more and wanting to be more than a house mother, you know, um, a homemaker. But I think, uh, yes, you're, you're certainly right. The global CEO has less of a challenge than our American CEO. And I think what we're unfortunately doing to these women CEOs is waiting for them to to fail. I'm waiting for the headline that says Marissa just couldn't do it, and so she's on her way out. The investors have said she can't do it. The activist investor, though, I think it comes down to this. The mentality still exists, and it's a 1950s thing that women are nurturers. They're not going to really react badly. They're not going to be brash. They're not going to be aggressive and abrasive. And uh, I think that's false. I think there are enough women out there who are aggressive and going to go get it and going to fight back at investors who are going to say she's not going to fight when we put up a fight to her. What's the best way to deal with activist investors as a woman? And I noticed, for example, at HB, Meg Whitman put one on her board. I mean, I can't imagine why I would want to put someone on my board who wants to take me out. Uh, I mean, you put them on because they're they're going to bring some sort of weight to the job. Maybe they'll be able to uh, to bring finances or resources. Maybe there's uh, some sort of long term play there. Um, I mean, it, but I I imagine, and I don't know for a fact, but she put her put the person on the board to shut the person up, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, aren't there better? Can't you buy out their stock? out from under them or something? Well, typically they own the majority if, and even a little bit more than that um, in terms of the stock ownership. So, I mean, it's hard to, unless you can really raise that kind of capital and remove them, I think it's difficult. I'm not sure when you have huge companies like HP or that are highly capitalized, it, they, a lot of them own like three or four percent and that's a huge, that's, that may be billion dollars worth of stock, but it's not more than half. Yeah, but it's also, you never know what other, you know, types of connections that that person has. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are political reasons that are behind the scenes that we are unaware of that made her do that. Because I, I can assure you that probably wasn't a very easy decision for her to do. But I think, I think though, that it was a smart one. Mm -hmm. Because if you're on a board, then you have a certain responsibility to the success of that, of that organization, right. of that corporation. And I think that by doing that, it's like, okay, if you, you're putting your money where your mouth is, let's put your leadership and your thought and your strategy you where your mouth where your mouth is as well and I think that doing that was probably the shrewdest and smartest move that she could have made. Do you made. think a woman CEO is more likely to react that way than a man? Probably because a man I think is more likely to walk away when something when something gets tough or try and shut that person down rather than bring them in and yeah. I think that that is why women CEOs are more successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I see the opposite, but I, I think it's a good tactic. Like you said, it's the best tactic. I, I think we're still perceived largely to see women as 
I'll walk away from it. Let's gently deal with this instead of aggressively. I think what we've traditionally seen is men who are abrasive, not afraid to sit face to face with that person and have that tough conversation. But you're right, women are changing. So it's a good thing. <laughs> and so are men. Behind the headlines, women make up 27% of the STEM or science technology, engineering, and math workforce. African-American women represent fewer than 5% of that group. As part of our Black History Month coverage, we look at the lack of diversity in those industries. I had never seen a black female engineer until I was in graduate school. I went to the Nesby conference, and so if I saw a professional woman in a suit, I was just so happy. That was very important to me to know that at least they existed. Dr. Pamela McCauley was recently honored as Black Engineer of the Year. She's one of a handful of African-American women who are tenured engineering professors in the U.S. McCauley lectures at schools nationwide about overcoming obstacles. As a teen mom from a small town, she didn't let her circumstances destroy her dreams. We need to provide exposure for our children because even though I'd never seen a Black female engineer, something inside me made me believe that I could do it. One in seven engineers is a woman, according to a 2011 report by the U.S. Department of Commerce. Women hold less than 30 percent of computer science jobs. Researchers found that while some women associate careers in STEM with white males, others already established in the field leave partly due to hostile work environments and discrimination. We don't feel like it's a career for women. African-American women are 2 percent of the engineers today. Most disconcerting is when they leave the field because they may feel marginalized or don't feel like they really have the opportunities that some of their counterparts have. And I'm saying, don't go, don't go. I say, you survive rigid body mechanics, statics and dynamics, thermodynamics, calc one, two, and three. Where are you going? If you survive those things, it is possible to figure out how to manage and navigate through your career. Retention is not just an issue in the workplace. It's also a problem in schools. Macaulay suggests encouraging girls to take science and math classes at an early age. You'll see second and third grade girls running around saying they're going to be an astronaut and a doctor and do all these wonderful things. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to be Miss America, too. They have that very open and receptive mindset and are very uh, willing to consider the more technical and challenging professions. McCauley says in middle school, girls' perceptions change, and they may not see engineering and technical fields as good professions for them. Help them understand how relevant it is. I mean, the, the color of my lipstick, you know, the, the science went into this. I mean, the, the, the clothing that I wear, also the, the airplane that I flew in. I mean, there are so many relevant things that we do, and everywhere you look, you're touching something that's STEM-related. Connecting real-life experiences to STEM is only part of the solution. A pilot program is underway with the goal of creating more inclusive curriculae and helping faculty bond with minority women. Macaulay recommends training faculty how to address students who may be the only minority in the room. There is oftentimes inherent bias in our interaction and expectation associated with students who are females or those who are of color. It helps to have someone from the outside who's a STEM professional to come in and say to the student, hey, I went through the same thing. You're lucky you're here. At least there's three of you guys. I was the only one. McCauley encourages mentorship but says young women should consider mentors who may not look like them. We need to understand that we should be comfortable in asking people uh, to mentor us if they're in the disciplines that we're interested in. And while it would be wonderful if you could have a black female, if you're a black female, to mentor you because she can help you understand certain things that you as only a black woman may experience, uh, it's important not to limit ourselves to that. Though the numbers are quite low, the number of women of color entering STEM fields is on the rise. Of the 30 fastest growing professions, 15 are STEM related. Uh, the salaries are very competitive. Uh, and there are opportunities for growth. And I'm hopeful that as we see more and more women of color and women and people of color in STEM professions, that you will start to see more of those glass ceilings broken. Amazing woman to yes. come from that background and get where she's gotten to. Just exactly. amazing. Um, so why 
d why aren't more young African American women doing that? Well, I think she hit the nail on the head. I think that when our girls are small, they see the world as their oyster, but something happens to them as they navigate through the educational system and their dreams get stunted. And we need to make sure that we reach out to young girls and let them know you can do anything. We expose them to different opportunities. We let them see how relevant things are. Organizations like Black Girls Code, for example, are very important. So we need to let them know that the sky's the limit. And then when they're in situations, make sure that they are supported so that they can stay there and thrive. Why is it, I, I would imagine that there are a lot more uh, young Indian women in these fields and succeeding um, percentage-wise. Why, why is to that? Push to it uh, is the answer uh, by parents who feel that, <laughs> you know, careers in, in science, engineering, technology, maths, that is everything that an Indian American uh, first generation child should be pursuing. This story is deeply personal for me because I'm somebody who dropped out of engineering and it was really, really hard. I wish I met her 10 years ago. Um, it, it's just Why how, did you drop out? Uh, I didn't feel there was a place for me. I didn't mm -hmm. see anybody of color. In a class of Honors Engineering 101 in 2001, fall of 2001, I walk in, 30 people, five of us are female, and I'm the only person of color. Wow. And it was a major state school, and I loved every experience. I had a scholarship for the program. Three years later, I dropped out. Wow. 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 Yeah, and you wish you could go back? Ten years later, I wish all the time. I have that conversation with my folks all the time. But I tell <laughs> them I became a political strategist because I still love numbers. And I got involved with Girls Who Code and other STEM mm -hmm. organizations, DC Web Women. I'm an active member, and uh, I love it. I've been, I've been doing it over the past couple of years because I don't want any girl to feel like there's not a place for her like I felt. And I don't think at that time I could, it was really that I didn't see anybody like me. I just didn't feel valued. I just didn't feel it was for me for some reason. Mm -hmm. So I walked away from it, and I'd pass Calc 1, 2, and 3 and all oh that other God. stuff. So too. you wow. passed Art. all the tough stuff. Passed the tough stuff, wow. earned a scholarship uh, that was based on merit, and, and gave it up. And I, I have deep regret for that. So getting involved in these STEM initiatives for me is everything, just to make mm -hmm. sure that if one day I do have a daughter, she'll never feel the same way. The regret mm -hmm. should be with your state school that allowed <laughs> yeah. that to happen, because I think that one of the most important things that we're missing with the reason why women, women of color, don't get involved in these fields is because there's no cultural competency training to yeah. support us. Had you been supported, had you been given a mm -hmm. mentor from you know walking in the door to cultivate you and to, and to kind of walk you through emotionally the process of being the only one. As somebody, I was not an engineer, but as somebody who grew up in a all white 96% suburb on Long Island, New York, it's like that is something that you have to learn how to deal with being the only one that is in the room. It is something, it is it's very trying yeah. on your self-esteem. But isn't it, oh, I yeah. would think, you know, let's let's break down STEM for a moment. Science, technology, engineering, and math. So in the science part, you have medicine, where women are now half oh, yeah. of all medical students. And I'm sure the percentage of women of color in medicine is much higher than it is in engineering. Mm -hmm. So what is it specifically about the hard science uh, and the tech fields that, that seem to be pushing women of color and women overall away? I mean, it could be that there's not a, a, an appreciation fostered at a younger age, um, and to the point of you know when you're when you're young, you're interested in sciences and you're interested in you know how things work, growing things, or the the science behind it. And somewhere along the way, we kind of miss that. And you know what? I, I think it's also important to recognize choice. I mean, it's great to um, to expose young women to lots of different things in sciences and math, and then let them make the choice for themselves. Show them that there are different types of, of opportunities or careers that they can pursue. And if they decide to go into the softer sciences, I. I'm a soft political science <laughs> scientist myself, but that's a choice I made because I really didn't like the hard sciences. And so we have to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of every young girl has yeah, to Yeah, but are you saying science. girls are m less likely on average mm. than boys to dislike, I mean, they're, they're less likely to like the uh, hard sciences than no, boys? No, not at all. I'm just saying that uh, that we should have a choice. And, and there may be a lot of uh, maybe a lot of young girls who say, you know what, actually I'm, I'm interested in something and I'm interested in counseling or I'm interested in psychology. And we have to respect that choice as well. 
I there is some research, though, that suggests mm -hmm. that when there are women of color in these hard science fields, they aren't supported. They aren't invited in, into study groups. Mm -hmm. uh, they aren't given challenging assignments by the professors. They're assumed to be less capable. Mm -hmm. And so all of those things leave extra baggage, emotional yes. baggage that they have mm -hmm. to work with work through along with the heavy burden of the academics that they're dealing with. And so that creates a hostile environment that sometimes it's hard to navigate through. And let's go down to like the toy aisle for a, a <laughs> oh, minute, God, right? yes. like, which I always come back to when we talk about she in the in the clip, Dr. McCauley talked about the fact that, you know, young girls at second grade, they feel like they are, can do the world. You walk down the toy aisle, everything is so gendered. Play with the dolls, boys get dirty and build things. That's the setup for hard sciences. All right, and that's got to change. That's it for this edition. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week.